Welcome back. This is the ESOP Guy. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We are on a journey to an ESOP. This podcast was produced to really help and provide a resource for those that are thinking they might want to consider an employee stock ownership plan for their business. Um, If this is your first time joining, I just wanted to say thank you so much and welcome. If you are interested in this podcast, we have a lot of different episodes. We're actually in season two, and you can find all of our episodes at journeytoanesop.com. So to kick off today, I wanted to kind of say that one of the topics that gets you know thrown around or talked about quite a bit in the ESOP community is this idea of being a fiduciary. And I think sometimes words get spoken and, and we, we kind of assume, or sometimes we all assume different things, like we know exactly what that means. Today, what we're going to do is, is get into more detail on, on fiduciary. Uh, this episode is going to be entitled The Spectrum of Fiduciary Liability. And to do that, we, I thought it would be really good to have some, an expert with us. And the expert today is Rick Pearl. He's with Fager Drinker. And they're an ESOP attorney firm, and Rick's background is, is strongly in the fiduciary side, and he's going to help us explore this issue and this topic and really provide some clarity. So with all of that, Rick, I want to say thank you so much for being on our podcast today. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So so as we get into this, um, it'd probably be good for, for everybody to kind of get a better feel for you know who you are um, and your ESOP experience. Can you... Give us a brief overview of your background and, and where you focus in on the in the ESOP world. Sure. I am an ERISA and ESOP litigator and counselor, and I focus principally on fiduciary issues, prohibited transactions, uh, and disputes involving valuations. So that's usually the, the ESOP transaction. can also be the annual valuations as well. Um, I, I began as actually an insurance coverage litigator. So from the time I was actually in law school as a summer associate until uh, boy, several years after that, many years after that, I represented policyholders in insurance disputes uh, about the meaning of insurance policies, the scope of insurance coverage. And, you know, I was, I was thinking about this today as I was preparing to, to have this talk with you about how that work involve a lot of contract interpretation, understanding the terms of agreements and you know, making sense of every word in a contract. And, mm. and I think when we uh, speak a little more in a few minutes, uh, I could explain how that sort of spilled over, I think, into how I handle um, fiduciary issues under ERISA. Uh, but that I was doing insurance uh, coverage, did some commercial litigation. And when I was still uh, an associate, I got my first um a role in an ESOP case, and as you know, you can't really just dip a toe in the ESOP world. I mean, uh, you got to you got to understand it. And, and from there, I decided I, it was something I wanted to focus on, and that's uh, how I ended up where I am today. Hmm. Awesome. So, um, when when you say ESOP litigator, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what you know, some some people are in this podcast; they don't they don't even have an ESOP yet. You know, so what do we mean by um, the litigation side of the ESOP world, and and how does that work? You know, in terms of your your day to day workload that you're doing. Sure, I, I actually divide the litigation into, into sort of two aspects, and one is the traditional litigation that everybody would think about when you hear that term, and that's a lawsuit or some type of dispute, some type of adversarial process. It could be a Department of Labor investigation. Um, Involving ESOP issues, and usually it's it's the more complex, um, broader plan-wide issues, as opposed to say you know, the individual participant who who uh, files a claim for benefits and and says you know you you underpaid me by a uh, hundred dollars or something. Aside from that. Um, any major issue affecting ESOPs, I will represent uh, clients, and that could be company side, could be you know, boards of directors, uh, ESOP committees, could be trustees, service providers, um, provide representation in, in, in those adversarial uh, disputes. Then the other aspect is, is it, it's more of a counseling, sort of the front end uh, addressing of these issues. And, and the way I get involved is, 
if there is a hot litigation issue or a, a question of fiduciary responsibility that comes up, there isn't a dispute, but it comes up, oftentimes um, the experience that litigators have can can help in forming the procedures to address those before they become issues. And we have, you know, litigators have the experience with, you know, how plaintiffs, lawyers, or even judges um, may be looking at certain issues, may be interpreting certain documents. And some of that knowledge can be helpful to, you know, the counseling side and and the plan uh, management, fiduciary management side. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. When you, when you, um, get into some of the given the examples of things like, you know, when we talk about adversarial disputes, um, one thing, one thing that like we need to lean in a little bit on is, is the reality that there are, as an ESOP gets created, um, the department of labor regulates it. And if there's an issue, when we, when we start thinking about it, it's, <clears throat> it's kind of like the, the risk starts to kind of be materialized. Right. So when you get an example you know, of an adversarial dispute, give us kind of a little bit of a, a, a background on something that might be, you know, a, a typical ESOP company that goes through um, a, a typical type of dispute that you'd have to deal with, an example of that. Sure. Right. And, and so the, the, I would say the highest profile, highest dollar disputes are the disputes over the initial ESOP transaction. Um, so I'll assume that most people are generally familiar with how that works, but just to, to, to give a high-level overview and explain where I come in, um, the initial ESOP transaction involves uh, typically three sets of parties. You'll have you know, the, the trustee who represents the interests of the ESOP, um, the company that's establishing the ESOP, and then selling shareholders whose stock is going to be purchased either directly or through some indirect uh, mechanism. There are different ways to structure them. But ultimately, stock is going to end up in the trust of the ESOP needs to be purchased uh, or uh, from the selling shareholders somehow. So you have those three parties. Um, okay. the, the ESOP trustee will represent the ESOP and approve a price and the terms of the transaction. That is, um, that is subject to challenge uh, under the rules of ERISA by participants and by the Department of Labor. Um, there's less of a risk to the company side, but there still are ERISA potential obligations on them and certain uh, ERISA, there's certain remedies, certain ways in which um, they can be sort of secondarily liable. Uh, so so disputes over the, the transaction that allege, say, that the ESOP paid too much or the terms were unfair to participants. You know, those would be disputes in which I would represent clients. Um, same with the, sometimes you have an ESOP that's uh, the, the company that's selling, and it's going to be the termination of the ESOP and sort of the winding down of its affairs. That also is a transaction that involves, you know, a setting of a stock price and approval of contractual terms, deal terms. That's subject to, to attack. Mm. Um, the, 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 those those transactions involve a lot of discretion, a lot of discretionary decisions, and typically any aspect of an ERISA plan that involves you know, discretionary decisions. You can imagine that there are different viewpoints on what it means to exercise that discretion uh, reasonably or prudently, and there, there are, uh, in fact, many different opinions on that. And that leads to quite a bit of litigation and quite a bit of, uh, you know, DOL scrutiny over those decisions. Yeah, which is, <clears throat> in a sense, you know, this is why we're doing this one. I, I want to, I want to, you know, expose the world, like, expose the listener to, like, hey, this is this is a reality. The the reality that the, the ESOP that you create could be under scrutiny someday, and the Department of Labor may have an issue. Um, the process of going through an ESOP, it, it's really, I, I would just kind of like, side, you know, take a sidestep and say, it's really important to do the planning really well and have the right advisors to get you to, to that point. Not to say that's going to give you a hundred percent, you know, um, invisible, you know, you're not going to have, you're not going to be invisible to the Department of Labor at that point, but you will have, you need to have confidence that your ESOP deal has been structured to where you're not falling into what Rick's talking about, that category of, of the ESOP paid too much. And so, um, those are just things that I think, you know, as we, as we talk about it, I think we want to, we don't want to like 
say that this is always going to happen. And the, and I wouldn't even know if you know the, the statistics on how many ESOPs, you know, have a claim or whatever. Uh, do you have that, Rick? I, I don't, but I, I can tell you that generally um, the more money, the more scrutiny. Mm-hmm. So you have some smaller ESOP deals that occasionally you'll get some scrutiny over something and it's, it, it can be uh, easier to resolve those disputes or you know disagreements, whatever it might be, um, than it would if it's a multiple hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. of transaction and you become a, a, a target. And, and I think a target, not from the perspective, you know, people may be thinking, um, people who maybe aren't quite as familiar with sort of the litigation landscape of, of, of these cases, you may be thinking, well, look, it, it, there really isn't, there shouldn't be much of a difference between the $300 million transaction and the $5 million transaction. Um, but the reality is that if you, if you are a plaintiff, uh, plaintiff's law firm and you sue the $300 million uh, transaction, the potential recovery is higher and, and the attorney's fees are higher and, and that, that just makes it worth their while. Um, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. What I mean to say is that you wouldn't expect the lawyers to be doing their work for free. Mm-hmm. And if the, if it's a, a $500,000 transaction and they have to spend three years litigating it, it just might, it might be a loser for them. Mm-hmm. So I don't want to cast aspersions on the plaintiff's bar, but just to say that that's, yeah. that's no, a reality I, in all areas of I, And I think that that's what kind of what I wanted to talk about. And it's just common sense, right? It's not, it's not even disparaging yeah. anybody. It's just saying, you know, that, that's kind of common sense. So, I think a lot of the, when you look at the averages, a lot of these ESOPs won't even ever have to think about that. But it, but I think it's important as we, as we kind of think about that as an example. Um, obviously this is, this is out there and Rick's, this is the kind of work that Rick is doing to defend ESOPs in different ways. Um, let's move on to like the idea of when we say fiduciary and we, we talk about that specifically to related to ESOPs. Um, can you give us a basic understanding of what that means? Um, just so that we have, we kind of start with, with good definitions. Sure. So ERISA, um, there, I think there are two aspects to figuring out what it means under ERISA to be a fiduciary. The first is, you know, who is considered a fiduciary, meaning, you know, what person or what entity, what committee, and, uh, you know, it, to, to what extent, I should say, as well. So a, a person can be a fiduciary for some purposes, but not for others. And then second question is, well, if you are a, a fiduciary, what does that mean? What does that require of you? What's the, sort of the standard that you have to follow? <clears throat> so under ERISA, the first question about who is a fiduciary is answered in a specific pr- provision, and it essentially says that anyone who exercises discretionary authority, and that means final discretionary authority, really the decision-making authority over plan management, plan administration, or the handling or disposition of plan assets, plan money, Mm -hmm. that person is a fiduciary. Mm. Um, Then the question, and, and by the way, that does not require a specific title. You don't have to be specifically identified. There are many, many cases and instances where um, people have inadvertently assumed fiduciary status, not wanting to. Um, the intention may have been for them not to, and it may even have been expressed in documents that they would not be. But once they start exercising discretionary authority, then upon that person's shoulders falls the burden of all of the obligations that ERISA imposes on fiduciaries. So the the, the fiduciary obligation under ERISA, ERISA is, is, is interesting in a lot of ways. And, and one is that it principally regulates benefit plans by regulating the conduct of the people who are characterized as fiduciaries. Mm. So um, rather than when you read through ERISA's fiduciary responsibility subsection, there's, a, there's actually a part, it's called a part, part five or part four of a, a specific ERISA subtitle that sets forth all the fiduciary responsibilities, many of those provisions are very, very short. And very, in my opinion, they mean almost nothing on their face. They're almost, it's almost impossible to really figure out, well, what, what does this really mean? So for example, <clears throat> you have a principal provision in ERISA, the, the prudent person standard of care, 
that or actually uh, it, it's there's a a subsection within which that prudent person is contained but that section says basically two things about fiduciaries number one you have to act exclusively for the participants to get them benefits and to pay the reasonable costs of the plan and number two you have to act with care skill and prudence mm. that's essentially it wow. so figuring the whole, out then that word yeah, ex- that word exclusively is a pretty big word, right? I mean, if I am wearing multiple hats in the company and I'm the trustee, internal trustee, for instance, um, but I'm also doing other things for the company, how do I, how do I do that exclusively? I guess that's the, the first thought I had. So the, the, the first step in that analysis is to identify what decisions are ERISA plan fiduciary decisions and what decisions are not. And that is, going to get you in in instances where there are disputes that gets you about 90 percent of the way to the answer to the question mm-hmm. because um ERISA structured in a way and congress intended this that corporate you, you cannot have an ERISA plan without having people who wear two hats there necessarily are going to be those who make executive corporate decisions and those who then have to make some ERISA decisions mm-hmm. so if you are making a decision that is not a discretionary plan management administration decision, and there's one exception I'll talk about in a, in a second, um, including decisions about amending the plan, terminating a plan, you know, adopting a plan, those are settler functions. Those are non-fiduciary, and the case law is really clear on that. Um, if it's a non-fiduciary capacity, a corporate capacity, your decisions can be adverse to participants. They can harm the participants. It doesn't, under ERISA, it doesn't matter. Mm. You are not governed by ERISA. Once you have a decision that starts treading into that discretionary plan management, plan administration, plan asset uh, decision making, um, and you have the fiduciary hat on, it has to be solely in the interest of the participants. Mm. Um, what that may, it, it, now that doesn't mean like for example you may have a, a a decision to make on behalf of the plan whether to engage in some kind of transaction or hire a service provider. Well, the other side to that is going to get paid and may benefit. That's fine. It's really on are who are you focused on when you're agreeing to those terms. Doesn't matter if somebody else happens to benefit or you know you, you, that's okay. Um, so it, it, it's really the, the line there is, is, is drawn between when are you wearing your corporate hat and when are you not. And as I said earlier, you can be a fiduciary for some purposes, but not for others. So, um, you know, some plans have fiduciaries for very, very limited purposes. And if they're not serving in that purpose, then they have no role in any of the other fiduciary decisions of the plan. It's not their obligation. They're not responsible for anyone else's decision uh, generally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, so so kind of talk about, let's just talk about like the specific roles in the company and let's, and let's so we're not um, merging everything too, too much when we think about, because some people don't really know like, who does what? And so if we just take it to it, the, the ESOP company and we go, we go focus in on like who, who's doing what? Let's talk about like first off who the, what the roles are and who they are. So you have the people that are running the company, the board of directors, your president, your, your leadership group. You have, um, the trustee. Um, you have, um, ESOP committees that are kind of designed for ESOP culture and things like that. Um, what other roles do we have that I didn't mention? like in an ESOP company? It, as far as um, fiduciary capacity or just generally? I think generally, and then I think we're going to talk about that generally, and then we're going to go into the fiduciary issues related to those specifically. Okay. So, yeah, that's right. You, you would have the company or the board of directors would be the principal named fiduciary typically, and that's a, that's a term under ERISA. So that, that's the, the person or entity that's identified in the plan as the primary person or entity having fiduciary responsibility over the plan. Um, Then you would have different, if it's the company, by the way, uh, it automatically defaults to the board of directors, directors to act on behalf of the company. So it would be the board of directors, you know, enacting the will of the company. Mm -hmm. Um, So the board would be uh, the fiduciary for some purposes. Now, 
those purposes depend really on what then what duties are assigned to others. Um, in an ESOP company and in many other types of plans, you have a trustee. The trustee has very specific responsibilities. Um, once those are assigned to a trustee, the board no longer has responsibility for those. They are solely the responsibility of the trustee. Mm, okay. um, so, it, it, so we can get into more detail if you'd like in a second. But mm-hmm. the, uh, I'll, so the others would be like the ESOP committee. Uh, the ESOP committee is is typically assigned, like you said, fiduciary response. Could be non-fiduciary, but fiduciary responsibility over discretionary decisions about you know plan communications to participants, things like that. So solely f- with respect to those issues, they would be the fiduciary. Um, you can then you have those who typically are not fiduciaries, but you'll find them in ESOP owned companies, record keepers, um, other types of service providers, maybe. Sometimes you have companies that assist with employee communications. Uh, you may have people who assist with claims. You have the financial advisor to the trustee that assists with the annual valuations and the valuations in connection with the transaction. And then you have legal advisors. You can have legal advisors to the company on ERISA issues, and you could have separate legal advisors to the trustee on uh, trustees' fiduciary issues and other issues that the trustee might need uh, legal assistance with. Mm-hmm. So that's generally the group. Um, you know, the, the, again, the, the, the principal fiduciary responsibilities when it comes to like major decisions are the trustee, that's like all matters of valuation, decisions, um, final decisions for uh, engaging in transactions, setting the annual valuation, things like that. And then the company or ESOP committee for some of the, you know, the like you said, more internal communication, things like that. Um, then there's this, this one area that uh, which maybe we should talk about a little bit because it does affect it, it, it affects companies and boards and even selling shareholders to some degree. And, th- and that's this ERISA duty to monitor. So somebody has to hire the trustee. Um, and that decision, the decision to retain a service provider to provide services to the, uh, to the, to the plan, that's a fiduciary decision. Um, so once the board or ESOP committee hires the trustee, the board or the ESOP committee has this continuing duty to monitor. Um, now, what that means is it, it's it, so this could, uh, one thing, I'll circle back real quickly to this, you know, act with the care, skill, and prudence uh, standard. That provision in its entirety actually says a, a little bit more, and it, it's important information that doesn't get any focus um, in a lot of cases and enough focus in, in a lot of cases. And, it, and what it says is a fiduciary has to act with the care, skill, and prudence of a person uh, familiar with such matters under the circumstances then prevailing in an enterprise of like character and like aims. Um, and so interestingly, the definition of the, or the, the standard of fiduciary conduct in ERISA the majority of that standard is not prudent or not act with care, skill, and prudence. It's the qualification to that. It's the context. It's telling you, you have to act with care, skill, and prudence, but we have to consider, number one, what type of plan this is. Number two, who are you and what's your role in this plan? And number three, what specific decision are you making? Mm. And, and all other factors, all other contexts that's supposed to inform that. And the reason I bring that up is if you let's think about an ESOP transaction where you have a board of directors that you know, is is an adverse party to the ESOP for purposes of that transaction. I mean, not adversity like they're they're fighting, but adverse meaning they're opposing parties on other sides of the table. You have selling shareholders who are an opposing party. The board of directors appoints the trustee and has this duty to monitor. So. There have been arguments made in, in litigation that if you are a board member and you appoint the trustee and you're also a selling shareholder and you have to monitor that trustee, mm. well, go over to the trustee's house every day and knock on the door and, and, and go through their work line by line and make sure they're doing it right. Mm. That to me is, is absurd. Um, 
Uh, and the reason is because of that qualification language in the standard of fiduciary conduct. You have to consider the fact that these are adverse parties. You're not supposed to be meddling in the affairs of the trustee. I said earlier that once fiduciary duties are allocated or given to one fiduciary and another one doesn't have them, which is the case of the board and, and the trustee, the, the fiduciary that doesn't have responsibility for those issues has no liability, no responsibility at all. You don't meddle in it. You don't get involved in it. You, you're not supposed to. You don't step over the line. Mm. So in that context, to me, what I think the duty of monitor means, and, the, and there are courts that have said this in other contexts, is you you appointed the trustee. All you have to do is just conduct whatever's reasonable under the circumstances to say to yourself, do, do I fire this trustee and get another one? So, for example, what if the trustee just never shows up? Yeah. Well, yeah, it's probably a prudent, recognizing that you're on the opposite side of the table. You're negotiating against each other. Mm-hmm. You know, it's from that perspective, it's probably prudent to say, you know what, I need to fire this trustee. Yeah, for but sure. what if the trustee showing up and doing their work and hiring the advisors? You know, that that's sort of the nature. These are all factors that, 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 uh, that inform the discussion of the scope of the fiduciary responsibility. Yeah, so to break that down a little bit, I think I <clears throat> first off, excellent overview. Like Rick, I mean, you're you're covering some big areas. The board of directors, without appointing the trustee, has that responsibility. But once they appoint the trustee, they have now taken care of their fiduciary responsibility by assigning it to the trustee, and so now they are no longer fiduciarily responsible for that aspect of the ESOP. Is that? That's exactly right. Is there, are there, once they've done that, is there, are there any other fiduciary responsibilities that the board of directors would have? Um, with respect to the ESOP transaction, you, there may be some things like employee communications that they could assume, but generally, no. Okay. Gen- generally, the answer is when it comes to, to, to the major decisions about an ESOP transaction are going to be made by the trustee. If there's anything left over, it may be a case by case thing, but the, you know, the, the board's obligation at that point is in its corporate capacity. It's non fiduciary. It's negotiating against them. Mm-hmm. That, that, that fiduciary hat is really only to look from across the table and say, any reason I should fire this person? Mm. No. Okay. Then they, the trustee is. You know, it, it, again, the, the, the litigation trend, and I say trend, I mean sort of the allegations trend. I haven't seen as much in court cases, but the trend is to, to really require the board to step over the line and start mm. invading, you know, the province of the, the trustee. And, and it, it, there's, there are many reasons to, to say that that's wrong. <clears throat> um, there are other cases in other contexts that say that that's wrong. Uh, but, but the but the fact remains, you know, you have to do what's prudent to make sure that you're comfortable with that trustee remaining mm-hmm. without without crossing the line and, and going and looking at the work product of your opposing you know, party across the table to you for sure. The transaction, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think one of the things I would comment on, and it sounds like this is what you're saying, if I'm a board of director on an ESOP company and we've hired a trustee. But we're not hearing from that trustee at all. And I, and I think one of the things I see is the trustees are super busy, right? Um, but my, if I'm not hearing from them at all, then I really need to stop and say, look, you know, it's been a whole year. They don't, they're not really interacting with us. We probably need to investigate and say, hey, what's going on? And then maybe take action. Then, then I'm doing my fiduciary responsibility. I, I, that's right. Yeah. It, it has to be something along the lines of, you know, fairly obvious for it to cause that type of problem. I say fairly obvious, you know, I, I don't want to go too far out there, but but really you just have to account for the real world implications of that. Like you, you can't start meddling in what the trustee does. And there has to be some sign that if you put 10 reasonable people around the table, all 10 would say, yeah, get rid of that trustee. They're not, there's no way you can keep them. Yeah. That would have to be the standard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, now let's, let's like, now we've got a company, we've created an ESOP committee and I'm, and I'm maybe just an example. I'm, 
created this committee because I really want my company to maximize the ESOP culture. Their job is to, you know, communicate out to the employees what's happening with the ESOP. Um, where would they be? You kind of like you kind of hinted to that they, they have some fiduciary responsibility. Where would they be um, if they didn't communicate correctly, or what? How would they actually be tripping on something if, from a fiduciary standpoint, for that committee? Right. So if if you have a committee that's handling the communications and something goes awry, um, and and there there can be you know you can debate what's appropriate communication and what's not. Um, but let's assume that that something just goes awry there. The 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 question for me, and I'm sort of answering this from from the end, and I'll, I'll sort of work my way back, but to explain why I'm doing it. But the 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 question for me is well, how does that harm people? Because ERISA doesn't really have it, it does, but they they don't have a lot of you know muscle to them. It, it, there's not a great way for participants or plaintiffs lawyers to to get money out of a communication lapse unless it it really caused damage, caused like financial injury to participants' accounts. Um, it can happen, and there have been cases like that. Uh, but aside from that, then, you know, you, you have some obligations under ERISA to provide documents to people, to provide disclosures. Some of those are fiduciary obligations. Some are just statutory obligations. Um, but what what I think ESOP committees need to be aware of is just generally if there's if there's a situation that involves money in particular investment decisions um, transaction decisions you know voting by by ESOP participants a pass through voting on matters you got to think that the, the communication um, to those participants might be in you know, often is you know part of the overall prudence of managing the plan and administering the plan is making sure that there's sufficient information under the circumstances uh, to to give to the participants that they might need in that particular situation. So, unfortunately, there's not a real clear answer to those. Some, yeah. You know, some, they're, they're, I, yeah, I, it, I think, you, you know, and, and I get that because it's going to depend, right? And But I think one of the things I, I immediately always go to, and I think ESOP committee, culture committee, <laughs> Is, is we kind of say it's the fun committee. And so you put all your, your people that just are creating the parties and stuff, but you really need to have somebody in that committee that is extremely detailed and responsible, um, administratively and, and understands ESOPs, especially like you said, if it's a voting issue and they're responsible, um, and they don't get that out correctly, then that could be a fiduciary problem for them. Yes, that, and that is a, a really, really, really good point, is that there are ERISA aspects to any benefit plan and ESOPs, of course, um, that people aren't sensitive to. And, you know, if, if, if you are not familiar with those, I don't expect, and that you probably agree with me, I don't expect anyone to just figure them out or just have that sort of pop in their head. You have to... You have to know them, mm-hmm. and you you are one hundred percent right that there can be ERISA implications to, to decisions that are made by committees that the committee members like they may be wonderful for a lot of other purposes, but when it comes to the sensitivity to those, they just may not have the experience, and that's a real pitfall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's so as we as we start thinking about the order of, of fiduciaries um, in an ESOP company. You know, honestly, before we had this, I, I don't, I wasn't thinking much about the committees at all. I, I just, I always think trustee immediately, but um, I think that the, if I had to, if we had to order it, we'd go board of directors appoints their fiduciary to the trustee. Trustee is now the primary fiduciary. Then second to them is the ESOP committee. And then outside of that, is there any other fiduciary responsibility in, in the company? Because we have this bucket of non-fiduciary advisors and third parties that don't have anything to do with fiduciary responsibility. Is that kind of true? Yes. Yeah. Typically, typically the case, say for the situations where somebody steps over the line, you know, an advisor or something is just makes a decision or is making the decision, you know, something like that. But yeah, those would be the three 
principal bodies that you would see, you know, maybe claims handlers, administrators, but, but that's usually a plan side thing, like the plan or uh, the company will, will have uh, an administrator or, or, or maybe a third party will help with some claims or the trustee can assist on some of that. But that, that would probably fall you know, within those, somewhere within those three. So the, the consequences of being a fiduciary would be that if the trustee is found, you know, to be liable, what does that mean for them, you know, personally when it comes down to a claim for an ESOP that has a problem? Right. So ERISA has a provision that says a fiduciary who breaches any of the fiduciary responsibilities is personally liable for losses. And it says to the plan, uh, it's a technical issue, but but basically economic damages to a participant's account or the plan account, your fiduciary is personally liable for those. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's pretty scary. I mean, that's why, you know, not everybody wants to be and step into that role of being a trustee. Um, or if they do, you better be really pretty sure that that's, you know, you know what you're doing kind of thing. Um, I think the deeper thing, too, would be to make sure that your employee um, – committee that we just talked about, the ESOP committees, <clears throat> would understand that that it's the same thing for them, right? I mean, they're still personally liable. Yeah, th- there's there's a gray area, I think, a bit of a gray area. If, if you have a committee that's a fiduciary, what does that mean for the individual members? But generally, there is personal exposure. I wouldn't say that they're immune from it, but um, yes, it can be both the committee and the individual members. Same thing with the board of directors. And if it's an institutional trustee, you usually don't get to the individuals um, for the uh, the entity. But anyone, anyone or any entity that is a fiduciary can be personally liable. And that, you know, that also raises the importance of not only understanding your business and what you're doing, but you know, insurance and indemnification, having measures in place to protect you. For sure. Yeah. Which, which probably is a whole nother podcast, but, um, I just wanted to kind of throw out when we talk about it, I wanted to kind of like, you know, seal it up with, Hey, this is, this is why it's, it's maybe a bigger issue. And, and the reason why they're, they're so severe is that they're basically protecting the department of labor is trying to protect the, the people that have these retirement accounts. And so that's why it's a, it's a pretty serious issue. So, um, I, yeah. my goal here today with, with Rick was really not to scare everybody, but just lay out like the facts and just say, you know, you have to understand what the facts are, um, as part of thinking about, you know, doing an ESOP. So kind of my, my thoughts, my final comments are just definitely, you know, the more you know about ESOPs, the better. So continue to listen, learn and ask your advisors these questions. Um, you know, people like Rick that do this, you know, full time in the litigation world. I mean, they're very good resources to to understand how to create and build the plan the right way, how to make sure that the right people are appointed in the right places. And and then again, like he said, like, how do you protect yourself? So those are things like with insurance, um, things that just will be helpful, you know, as you start thinking about your ESOP. So any any final comments, Rick, from your standpoint? Uh, I, I think you made a lot of really great points, and I and I very much appreciate uh, being a part of this. Thank you. Oh, well, it's great, great to have you today, and look forward to you know future conversations. Um, with that, I just wanted to say thank you for for joining the podcast today. If you if you like it, please subscribe and share it with a friend. Have a great day, and we'll look forward to the next step on this journey to an ESOP. <laughs>